Oh, there's something in my chest that I can't hide When feelings get involved, I'm terrified Cause I've been here before and said goodbye Hello, everybody. How are we doing tonight? Yeah, that's what I thought. While I was sitting here, I was just checking my captions, and the uh, link literally ran out as I was look <laughs> checking them. <laughs> I watched the button turn from blue to red, and like, all right. Damn it. Jim and Janet. But we're all right now. We're up and running. And we are ready to. Oh, where did my thing go? Where did it go? Oh, no. Ready to um, finish up this chapter that's taken three sessions this, this will be the third one that's taken uh three sessions this, this will be the third one to uh to finish because it was so freaking long um so we've got the last 22 pages of the chapter on the kabbalah um and the kabbalists so we'll finish it up I don't know about y'all, but I am very much enjoying this book so far. All right. So I stopped in the middle of page 244 because it was a good stopping point. So here we go. Actually, I'm going to wet my whistle first. Okay. So jumping right on into it. It is necessary at this point to say something more about alchemy. 
although it is difficult to dispute the view that it is a pseudoscience, the crude forerunner of chemistry. But it cannot be entirely dismissed. Dalton suggested that matter is made up of small particles called atoms in 1808, but it was not until towards the end of the 19th century that scientists discovered ways to explore the atom. When they did, they discovered the discovery that all materials in the universe are made up of the same building blocks, protons and electrons, the proton being 1,836 times heavier than the electron, an atom is like a small solar system. The sun at its center is made up of a block of protons and neutrons. A neutron is a particle that combines proton and electron. Well, while the planets that circle in, remember, again, 1971 is when he, uh, this came out. While the planets that circle in their orbit are the electrons. Each atom has the same number of protons as electrons, the protons being charged positively, the electrons negatively, and the difference between gold and silver is nothing to do with the amount of air, fire, or water in it, or with the its azoth, but simply that gold has 79 protons in its center and 79 electrons circling around it, while silver has only 47 of each. The transmutation uh, of the elements is, is taking place all the time. The element radium with an atomic number 88, the number of protons in its nucleus, neutrons don't count, give off radiation known as alpha or beta rays until it turns into lead with an atomic number of 82. The same is true of all the other radioactive elements. By bombarding elements with streams of neutrons, physicists can sometimes knock off a few protons or electrons, and turn one element into another. But this can only be done with elements that are very close together in atomic number. In theory, it should be just possible to change gold into mercury by adding one proton and electron to it, or transforming it into platinum by knocking off one proton and electron. Needless to say, this could only be done in such tiny quantities and at such vast expense that it is hardly a practical solution to the problem of the alchemists. It would seem, then, that we should be able to dis dismiss alchemy as pre-scientific chemistry and leave it at that. And if we insist on sticking to a rationalist standpoint, there is no alternative. However, fairness compels us to admit that this would be the easy way out. As always in these occult matters, we come to the conclusion that they may be exceptions there that they may be exceptions to the laws of nature. For example, the Dutch physician Helvetius, whose real name was Johann Friedrich Schweitzer, uh, wrote a circumstantial account of an encounter with an al alchemist. Helvetius was a, a man of good reputation who became physician to William of Orange, and historians of chemistry are generally agreed that he was above suspicion. If he was tricked, that is another matter, but no one has suggested how it could have been done. The 19th century historian of chemistry, Hermann Kopp, prefers to keep an open mind about the case. Helvetius' account is given additional weight because his own attitude to alchemy tended to be skeptical, and he would certainly have been indignant to be called an occultist. In his book of a transmutation, he tells how a stranger came to his house on December 27, 1666, wanting to discuss the making of fireworks. He describes him as a small man with a plebeian accent and northern from northern Holland and a pockmarked face. The stranger called Helvetius, told Helvetius that he admired his treatise against the sympathetic powder of Sir Kenelm Digby and asked Helvetius if he had ever come across the Grand Catholicon, the universal remedy for all ills. Helvetius said he hadn't. The stranger then asked him if he would recognize the Philosopher's Stone if he saw it, and produced an ivory box containing three small lumps of stone the color of sulfur. Helvetius begged for a little of it for remembrance, but the stranger declined. Helvetius managed to scrape off a grain of the stone with his nail, and later tried 
dropping it into molten, melted lead. The result was that almost the whole mass of lead flew away and the remainder turned into a mere glassy earth. That was a quote, I guess. Um, I keep looking at the screen because I've got a note saying an ad is starting in 37 seconds. The stranger discoursed at length on his, this first occasion about the use of semi-precious stones to cure diseases. He also made a drink from warm rainwater, laminated silver, and white powder, which he and Helvetius shared, the result being that Helvetius felt pleasantly tipsy. The stranger declined to comment on the drink, but went on to describe how his master had taught him how to transmute lead into gold. Okay, and I'm going to pause there because the... Um, ad is supposed to be starting in right about now. Of course, I don't know how long it is. I'm going to assume about 30 seconds. I think that's what I have it set to. So I will start reading again in another 10. So if I'm off by a bit, I apologize. Okay, so getting back to it. On his second visit, three weeks later, the stranger took Helvetius for a country walk and talked of the elixir of life and other matters. Helvetius tried to persuade him to stay at his house, but he was of Quote, he was of so fixed and steadfast a spirit that all my efforts were frustrate. End, end quote. The stranger finally gave Helvetius a tiny crumb of the sulfur-colored metal. When Helvetius complained about the smallness of the amount, the stranger asked for it back, cut it in half, and threw the other half into the fire, saying that Helvetius still had enough for his purposes. Helvetius thereupon confessed what had happened when he stole a fragment of the stone on his nail and showed the stranger, whom he called Elias, the crucible. The stranger told him he should have wrapped it in wax before dropping it in, so it would not vaporize instantly on contact with the hot lead. So far, the story sounds like a confidence trick. The stranger goes away again and promises to return the next day, but he fails to do so and never comes again. The natural sequel would be that Helvetius tries the fragment of Philosopher's Stone and nothing happens. In fact, quote, I cut half an ounce or six drams of old lead and put it into a crucible in the fire, which being melted, my wife put in the said medicine made up into a small pill or button with which presently such a hissing and bubbling in its perfect operation that within a quarter of an hour all the mass of lead was totally transmuted into the best and finest gold which made us amazed as if planet struck i would not i could not sufficiently gaze upon this so admirable and precious work of nature for this melted lead showed us the most rare and beautiful colors imaginable yea and the greenest color which as soon as as poured into an ingot, it got the lively, fresh color of blood, and being cold, shined as the purest, most refined and resplendent gold. End quote. A goldsmith confirmed that it was pure gold, not in, not content with relating these wonders. Helvetius goes on to declare that a quantity of this gold mixed with silver and nitric acid produced still more gold. In 1782, a young man named James Price inherited a large sum of money and bought a country house at Stoke, near Guild Guildford in Surrey. Later in the year, he announced that he had discovered how to transmute metals and asked a number of distinguished men to come and check his claim. A group that included Lord Ons Onslow, Lord Palmerston, not the Prime Minister but his father, and Lord King watched him turn mercury into silver by heating it with a white powder and mercury into gold by heating it with a red one. The ingots thus made were tested and found to be genuine and were shown to the king, George III. But Price said that 
he could not prepare more of his powders without damage to his health. The Royal Society pressed him very hard, and the resulting controversy seems to have unhinged his mind. He committed suicide by drinking cyanide in front of three members of the Society who had been sent to examine his claims. The career of Alexander Seton, a Scottish alchemist, is perhaps the most startling of all. He lived in a seaside village near Edinburgh, perhaps Port Seton, and in 1601 was involved in rescuing Dutch mariners whose ship was wrecked nearby. In the following year, he went to see the pilot James Hawson at Enkhuizen near Amsterdam. The friendship was a warm one, and Seton finally revealed to Hawson that he could manufacture gold and proved it by making gold of a piece of lead by adding a powder. A little of this alchemical gold was, gold was given to a doctor named van der Linden, whose grandson, a historian of chemistry, relates the episode. Seton then proceeded to travel around Europe, and his next chronicler was a German professor from Strasbourg, Wolf, Wolf, Wolfgang Deinheim. Deinheim was a skeptic about alchemy. Seton invited him and James, Jacob Zwinger, a Swiss savant, to witness another e exhibition of gold making by means of a lemon yellow powder. Deinheim and, or I'm sorry, Deinheim, I'm pr mispronouncing that. The E is the dominant um, vowel there. Deinheim and Zwinger were convinced, and Deinheim wrote of the episode. In Strasbourg, Seton seemed to have caused trouble caused trouble to a goldsmith named Gustenover. At at all events, Gustenover was presented with a quantity of powder by a stranger who made experiments at his house in Hirschborgen. Gustenover proceeded to make gold. He demonstrates his abilities before the members of the city council, who were even allowed to carry out the experiments themselves. Unfortunately, these events came to the knowledge of Rudolf II, Emperor of Germany, whose seat was at Prague. Rudolf, an untalented king, was an avid occultist. He sent for Gustover and demanded the secret. Gustover told him he had used up all the powder. The king refused to be convinced, and Gustover, after an unsuccessful attempt to escape, spent the remainder of his life in jail. Seton spent the next year traveling around Europe. His mission seems to have been to co convert skeptics to alchemy, and according to the stories contained in his life, and that's in italics, so I'm assuming that's a title, uh, he was entirely successful. In 1603, he married the daughter of a Munich burgher, eloping with her to Crossen, the seat of the elector of Saxony. This proved to be a major error. The elector asked for demonstrations of his skill, then asked for the secret. When Sutton refused, he was tortured and kept in jail. A student named Michael Sendegovius contrived his escape. He had friends at court and was allowed to visit Sutton. When the guards had been lulled by his frequent visits, Sendegovius managed to make them drunk one night and escaped with Sutton. Together with Sutton's wife, they fled to Krakow. Sutton declined to part with his secret, even to his rescuer, but when he died, worn out by his sufferings, a few months later, he left the remainder of his powder to Sendegovius. Sendegovius married Mrs. Sutton and had a highly su successful career as an alchemist, dying in Parma at the age of 84 in 1646. He never discovered the secret, and when the powder was exhausted, became a charlatan, but in the financial sense, he was in every way luckier than Seton, and was given a country estate by King Sigismund of Poland. He published some of Seton's works under his own name, and these works continued to be reprinted for the next two centuries. These accounts are harder to defend or explain than anything else in this book, and the temptation to dismiss them is very strong. Helvetius may have had a reputation as an honest man, but perhaps he had also a touch of the charlatan. 
Price's suicide makes it look as though he had used fraud to deceive his noble witnesses. I first came across his story in a popular vol volume called Unsolved Mysteries by Valentine Dial. I looked up James Price in J. M. Stillman's Story of Alchemy and Early Chemistry and could not find it, nor could I find any reference to Price in any other reference book. I concluded that Mr. Dial had found the story in some volume of doubtful authenticity. However, reading the book on alchemy by E. J. Holmyard, whose Elementary Chemistry is still one of the best school textbooks, I found an account that bears out Mr. Dial in most details, except his assertion that experienced chemists were allowed to examine the entire laboratory, etc. Holmyard states clearly that the various noble lords were untrained in science, but there is no reason to suppose that they were not watching the whole process closely. As to the life of Seton and Sendegovius, its source, sources are hardly as authentic as that of Helvetius, and no skeptic would have difficulty pulling it apart. Assuming that we are not disposed to pull it apart, what explanation can be offered? The account of Seton's life given by Lewis Spence in his Dictionary of Occultism, which paraphrases the life of Seton, declares that Seton refused to give Sendegovius his secret because it was impossible to to him as an adept to reveal the terms of the awful mystery. That is to say, it was not purely a matter of chemical preparation, but of magic. And magic, I have suggested, depends basically upon the summoning of spirits by natural mediumship. If we can accept that spirits or some other strange power, perhaps mental, caused Daniel Dunglas home to float in and out of the windows, allowed him to handle red-hot coals, and prevented objects from slipping off tilted tables, it is perhaps not a great step to believe that for a different type of medium, they might convert mercury into gold. It is worth bearing in mind that the psychologist Jung regarded alchemy as the predecessor of modern psychology rather than of chemistry, and in the autobiographical uh, memories, dreams, reflections, he makes it clear that he regarded the discovery of alchemy as one of the greatest intellectual adventures of his life, one that was heralded by the whole, a whole series of premonitory, 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 yeah, premonitory dreams. I, I, I'm assuming that meaning premonition. Um, he admits that when he first attempted to read a 16th century alchemical treatise, his first reaction was, quote, good Lord, what nonsense. This stuff is impossible to understand, end quote. But gradually he came to realize that he had stumbled upon the historical counterpart of his psychology of the unconscious. Over 10 years of close study, he came to see that alchemy is a great deal more than an attempt to make gold. It is an attempt to penetrate the mystery itself, the mystery Jung came to identify with the unconscious, and, the discovery, and to discover the laws of the secret working of the universe. Alchemy was the distinctive form taken by magic in the 17th century. The philosopher's stone it sought was nothing less than man's ultimate control over death. In modern terminology, we might say that it was man's attempt to learn to make contact at will with the quote-unquote source of power, meaning, and purpose in the depths of the mind to overcome the, the dualities and ambiguities of everyday consciousness. It would be missing the point to say simply that Jung regarded alchemy as a symbolic form of psychology, in which the manufacture of gold becomes a symbol of the transformation of the personality through the merging and blending together of the noble and base elements, the conscious and the unconscious, although this phrase is Jung's own. He would hardly have spent a decade studying this subject unless he felt that it had something important to teach him. Alchemy, Jung believed, was less concerned with chemical process than with psychic process, the transformation of the personality. 
All men have certain moments in which they feel like gods or supermen, as when Nietzsche described himself as feeling, six, quote, 6,000 feet above men and time, end quote. A divine secret slumbers in matter, in attempting to liberate it, says Jung, ma man takes upon himself something of the role of redeemer. This feeling of the significance hidden behind the changing face of matter is obviously close to David Foster's information universe, a concept that Jung would have appreciated. The secret sought by the alchemist was, according to Jung, the secret of the transmutation of consciousness into the godlike state, ultimate individuation. He associated it also with the aim of the yogis, and it is significant that unusual powers over matter are regarded by Hindus as a natural byproduct of the spiritual transformation of the yogi as, as with the alchemist. Jung's view of alchemy is certainly the profoundest that has appeared in the 20th century, and his essays on the subject are among the most fascinating and convincing that he ever wrote. It is now no longer possible for an intelligent person to dismiss alchemy entirely as the product of superstition and ignorance. And what of that much maligned subject, astrology? Here the ob objectors seem to have an irrefutable case. The ancients based their calculations upon the assumption that there are seven planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the Moon, and the Sun. They included the Moon and the Sun, but were unaware that the Earth is a planet. They were also unaware, of course, of the existence of Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and the asteroids, those fragments of a planet that exploded between Mars and Jupiter. One might add that the existence of this lost planet was predicted by Bode's law, after which a careful search revealed its fragments. Surely a conclusive demonstration of the superiority of the laws of science over those of astrology. How can one take seriously a science that declares that Mars exerts a warlike influence because the planet happened to be named after the Roman god of war? But the case for astrology is stronger than it looks. If we admit the existence of some form of prevision or second sight, then we are accepting that certain human beings possess unusual powers of intuition, even of intuiting the future. The whole question of the nature of time will be discussed in the final chapter. Any psychiatrist will confirm that many people are affected by the full moon, and that there is nothing in modern psychiatric or medical theory to account for this. If the moon can affect us, then why not the other planets? As to the objection that the astrological characteristics of a planet are derived arbitrarily from mythology, the astrologers would deny it flatly. The planets are named after various gods and goddesses because their influences had been observed to correspond. Venus was named after the love goddess because she was observed to exert an influence in matters of love. In this way, Mars came to be no named for warlike influences, Mercury for intelligence and ability, the winged messenger of the gods, Jupiter for the fatherly qualities, protectiveness, good humor, love of order, Saturn for evil and failure, the sun for creativeness, the moon for imagination, poetry, and the other qualities of the white goddess. The moon is also associated with instability and change, hence lunatics. Astrology, then, is based upon the same system of lunar knowledge that, as the I Ching, the tree alphabet, and the Kabbalah, and it is no more an exact science than palmistry. Like palmistry, it depends upon an almost mediumistic faculty. In his remarkable book, Urania's Children, Alec Howe describes his own teacher in astrology, Mrs. Phyllis Naylor, and goes on, quote, The mathematical side was easily learned, but I could not catch Mrs. Naylor's skill in describing the psychological characteristics of the people whom I knew well, whose horoscopes I had produced for her inspection. But, I, but uh, blah, she had no idea of their identity, end quote. Howe goes on to tell how he was challenged by a professional astrologer to describe what had happened to him on two particular days of his life, a challenge no other astrologer had been able to meet. 
Using the Hamburg system, Howe succeeded so well that the astrologer gave him a testimonial admitting that had I, quote, had I not known otherwise, prior knowledge might have been suspected, end quote. And this, most astrologers would agree, is the essence of astrology. Not a complicated mathematical system or a system of beliefs, but a knack, like water dividing, of seeing the connections between character and planetary influences. As with mediumship and divining, we can only say that it does work and that no one has the least idea why. It is a lunar system and refuses to conform to the methods of ordinary science. Alec Howe's book is largely devoted to Carl Ernest Kraft, 1900 to 1945, an astrologer who attempted to prove astrology statistically by studying thousands of horoscopes of well-known men and demonstrating that the major events of their lives and the exact dates of their deaths could be predicted from their natal horoscope. His vast treatise on astrobiology, 1939, is crammed with facts and figures and looks as impressive as a government blue book. Mr. Howe's c conclusion is that although it certainly does not read like the work of a madman, quote, it has no scientific importance whatever, end quote. And yet, Kraft was a highly talented astrologer. On November 2, 1939, he sent a letter to a Nazi intelligence chief predicting that Hitler's life would be in danger from an explosive between the 7th and 10th of November. On the 9th, there was a bomb attempt on Hitler's life in the Bürgerbräu beer hall in Munich that killed seven people and wounded 63. Kraft himself was eventually a victim of Hitler's purge against astrologers, who were supposed to have been to have influenced Hesse's flight to England, and died en route to Buchenwald in, Jan in January 1945. The Hermetic Century produced three men whose names have become almost synonymous with magic, Agrippa, Paracelsus, and Nostradamus. None of them were magicians, but of the three, Nostradamus was the gr has the greatest claim to occult powers. Excuse me. Michael Nostradamus was born in Saint Remy in France, or Saint Remy, I, I think is that how it should be pronounced, uh, in the year 1503 of Jewish Christian parents. His grandfathers on both sides were physicians and astrologers to quote unquote good King Rene of Anjou, who lived at Aix, A -A -S, A -I -X, in Provence. Michael's father was a notary, his maternal grandfather, being out of a job after the death of King René, devoted himself to the education of his talented grandson, and Michael learned Greek, Latin, Hebrew, medicine, and astrology. When his grandfather died, the other one took over Michael's education. It was decided that he should become a physician, and he was sent to study at the university at Montpelier. He passed his exams without difficulty, and no sooner was he qualified than plague broke, broke out in Provence, and he was able to demonstrate his medical skill. It proved to be as remarkable as that of Paracelsus. He was a born healer, and he seemed unafraid of the plague that killed the townspeople of Montpelier by the hundreds. From 1525 until 1529, he traveled around helping to combat the plague, and on his return to Montpelier, finally received the doctor's degree that he had earned four years before. For the next two years, he practiced and taught in Montpelier. Then he set out again on his travels. Unlike Agrippa and Paracelsus, Nostradamus was not a flamboyant personality. There was an instinct in him derived from generations of persecuted Jews for bowing to the storm and keeping himself in the background. For this reason, he gained more material success than either of his remarkable contemporaries. He settled in the town of Agen and became a close friend of Scaliger, one of the most famous scholars in Europe. There he decided to marry. His practice prospered. Then the plague broke out again and killed his wife and two children. He moved on again. 
Accusations of heresy followed him, for he had been rash enough to quote the commandment about brazen images when watching workmen casting the statue of the Virgin. There followed eight years of wandering. It seems to be a tradition among magicians of the 16th century. It was now that his odd powers began to operate. He began to get flashes of second sight. In Italy, he saw a young man named Felix Peretti, a swineherd who had become a monk. Nostradamus is said to have fallen on his knees and hailed Peretti as his holiness. It was after the death of Nostradamus that Peretti became Pope Sixtus V. Another story concerns a Signor de Florinville. Signor de Florinville. Sorry, <laughs> I, I get caught up in trying to pronounce these names. Uh, with whom Nostradamus was lodging, who asked Nostradamus to prophesy what would happen to two piglets in the farmyard. Nostradamus replied that a wolf would eat the white one and they would eat the black one. The seigneur, the seigneur ordered his cook to kill the white one for supper that evening, but as the pig lay in the kitchen ready for roasting, a young wolf cub kept as a pet began to make a meal of it. The cook killed the other pig and served it at supper. As they ate supper, de Florenville told Nostradamus that he had discovered his prophecy about the, or, or he had disproved his prophecy about the pigs. Nostradamus contradicted him, and the cook was sent for. Under the stern eye of his master, the cook admitted what had happened. The skeptical Florinville was convinced. In 1544, Nostradamus was again called upon to fight the plague, this time in Marseille. In November, floods cut off St. Saint-Rémy, and bodies of men and animals spread the plague still further. In 1546, he went to Aes en Provence to fight the plague. It is almost impossible for us nowadays to conceive of the horrors that were commonplace in the Middle Ages and after. The city of Aes, Aes, I guess, A-I-X, was almost deserted. The gates were closed, the streets full of unburied corpses, the churches empty, the law courts and parliament inoperative. What Nostradamus could do in a situation like this is not clear, although it is certain that he understood the importance of disinfectant and fresh air. It must be remembered that it was not until the 19th century that doctors understood about germs. Before that, a doctor who had just dressed a septic wound might go on to deliver a baby without bothering to wash his hands. At all events, he did, did so so well that he was voted a pension. He went on to Salon and performed the same services there, and in 15. 47, he decided to settle in Salon, or Salon, I guess. He married again, bought a house, and spent the remainder of his life, 19 years, practicing medicine and writing his quote unquote prophecies. He married a widow, and they moved into a house in a narrow, dark street. A spiral staircase led up to the top floor room that Nostradamus made into a study. From there, he could look out over the narrow roofs of the town, which was dominated by the old castle built on a steep rock. In this setting, he worked peacefully and built up a European reputation as a mage and prophet. A student and dis disciple, Jean de Chavigny, Chavigny uh, moved into the house and became Nostradamus's biographer. Eight years after moving to Salon, Nostradamus published the first ed edition of his prophecies, which he called Centuries, because the prophecies, each contained in four-line stanzas, were printed in lots of a hundred. The stanzas are extremely obscure. Moreover, they are not printed in any kind of order. Nostradamus was afraid of being accused of witchcraft. In his harmless comment about the statue of the Virgin, if his harmless comment about the statue of the Virgin could be construed as heresy, what might happen when he prophesied the rise and fall of kings and popes? Nostradamus leaned over backwards to explain that he was in no sense an occultist, telling his son, then only a few months old, in the preface that he had burnt all his books on magic in case they might be abused by seekers after power. 
But James Laver, the author of one of the best books on Nostradamus, states his conviction that Nostradamus used magical methods for his divinations. Certainly, the quatrains are odd enough. What could make a man sit down and produce hundreds of stanzas like this? Quote, um, he's actually got it in the original language um, and the translation. I'm just going to read the translation and not bother trying to butcher the original. Hunger maddened beasts will make the streams tremble. Most of the land will be under hister. In a cage of iron, the great one will be dragged when the child of Germany observes nothing. End quote. Did Nostradamus know what he meant by hister, or was it a name that simply came to him, as it were? Since the Second World War, there has been a tendency to assume that hister means Hitler. James Laver believes that the child of Germany observes nothing means that he observes no laws of decency in combat, which certainly fits Hitler. On the other hand, Robert Graves is of the opinion that Hister means the Danube Ister. Quote, he was concerned about Venice, which was in a very low condition in Nostradamus' youth, but made a glorious recovery at Lepanto, end quote. Graves' interpretation seems to be the more likely, particularly since in another stanza, Nostradamus mentions the Rhine and Hister, obviously referring to two rivers. And again, we have the original. It looks like it's in French. In the place not far from Venus, the two greatest ones of Asia and Africa of the Rhine and Hister will be said to come, cries and tears at Malta and on the coast of Liguria. The third Hister stanza says, Liberty will not be discovered. It will be occupied by one who is black, proud, low-born, and, and inquisitous. When the matter of the bridge is open, of Hister, Venice is greatly annoyed at the Republic. Laver, inter the, end quote. Laver interprets these as follows. He admits he does not know what is meant about the place not far from Venus, but suggests that the two greatest of Asia and Africa means Japan and Mussolini, who had invaded Abyssinia. Du Rhein et Hister means of the Rhine and Hitler, all referring to the Axis Pact, and that the last line refers to the bombing of Malta and Genoa, the second stanza says that liberty will not be recovered. The proud, dark, wicked man, Hitler, will occupy it. The bridge refers to the Pope, Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex is a bridge. And these lines refer to the concordat between Mussolini and the Vatican in 1928. The Republic of France is displeased. Graves suggests a simpler interpretation. The place not far from Venus is a place not far from Venice. The bridge referred to is a bridge across the Danube, Ister, i.e. interference in Italy and, and the south, Malta, by Charles V of Austria when he became Charles I of Spain. The republic that is greatly annoyed is Venice. If the same stanzas can be interpreted as differing to both the 16th and 20th centuries, I'm sorry, as how did I get dif differing? If the same stanzas can be interpreted as referring to both the 16th and 20th centuries, it may be felt that Nostradamus's prophecies are somewhat lacking in definiteness. This is certainly true when one considers individual prophecies, but it must be admitted that he is altogether more impressive when one considers the number of hits in his whole output. Laver acknowledged that he began to be impressed when he read, By night will come, uh, quote, sorry, By night will come through the forest of Rhines two married persons by a, by a tortuous valley, circuitous route, Hern the white stone, the black monk in gray, into Varennes, elected caput, causes tempest, fire, blood, and cutting. That was a difficult one to read. 
Varenne only appears once in French history, and this stanza may therefore be regarded as a test case. It is connected with the attempted flight of Louis the Sixteenth of France and his wife Marie Antoinette after the French Revolution. On June twentieth, seventeen ninety one, the king and queen disguised themselves and fled, escaping by way of the queen's apartment. The king in grey and the queen in white. They were re recognized by the postmaster of Chalon and, as a consequence, arrested at Varennes. They spent the night at the shop of a grocer named Sauce and then were returned to Paris, where in due course both were beheaded. Tranch Trancher, uh, I guess, I don't know, to slice, is used for beheading. Louis was a of a monkish temperament, and he was an elected king because he was the first French king to hold the title by will of the con constituent assembly rather than by divine right. There are too many hits in these four lines for them to be dismissed as chance. Two people, one in white, one in gray, coming to Varenne by a devious route, then tempest, fire, blood, and tranché, which, as Laver observes, sounds like the thud of the guillotine. There are also a few misses, or at least unexplainable phrases and words. There is no forest of rains, even though Charles A. Ward, in his book on Nostradamus, assures that us that this is what the road to Varane is called, but it is strange that he should speak of rains, queens, when a queen is involved in the incident. One edition of the of Nostradamus, Le Peltier, prints forest as fours, Latin for door. They escaped from the queen's door. And it is true that Nostradamus mixed Latin and French as he as he feel mixes Latin and French as he feels inclined. Sorry. What of Hearn the White Stone? This is supposed to be one of the epithets applied to Mary Marie Antoinette. Laver says Hearn or Hearn Hearn is an anagram of Queen Rhine. Uh, re yeah, I guess. Uh, Tempest, fire, and blood is an apt description of the reign of terror. In another quatrain, Nostradamus refers to a, a mitred, mitred, M-I-T-R-E-D, I've never seen that word before in my life, mitred husband, using the word part as he used du pars above for married couple and speaks of a trader called Narbon and a seller of oil called Sauce, S-A-U-C-E, Sauce. Sauce, as already mentioned, was the grocer in whose house the king and queen was confined at Varenne, while the Count of Narbon was a trader, a minister of the kings who's it, who intrigued with the re rebels. If all this sounds amazing, it should be borne in mind that it is not unique. Laver quotes Mestre Terrell of Autun, an astrologer who lived at the same time as Nostradamus, as actually mentioning 1789 as the year of great and remarkable changes and altercations, and upheavals regarding sects of the law, and adding that this period will last for 25 years, which takes us to 1814, the year of Napoleon's downfall, and another astrologer, Richard Roussat, published in 1550, five years before Nostradamus's centuries, a book on, titled On the Changes in the Times, in which he quotes the passage from Tyrell, proving its authenticity and giving a date 243 years from the time he wrote the book, i.e. 1792, as the date of the future renovation of the world, although the reno revolution started in 1789, the revolutionary calendar was inaugurated in 1792. And uh, Jean Muller or Jean, Mu Jean Mueller 
Um, I'm not sure which that's supposed to be. Liber Mirabilis, published in 1524, gives 1788 as the date of immense changes that will, quote, bring sad destinies. All the empires of the universe will be overthrown, and everywhere there will be great mourning, end quote. Admittedly, his way of writing 1788 is as follows. Quote, when a thousand years have been accomplished after the virgin gave birth, and when seven hundred more years have passed, the eighty-eighth year will be very astonishing, end quote, etc. But the date specified is quite definite. Nostradamus speaks of the vulgar advent in his preface addressed to his son, and gives an approximate date in the mid-1700s. On the whole, Nostradamus's prophecies concerning the revolution, the execution of the king and queen, and the rise of Napoleon are the most impressive and convincing examples of his power of prevision. This is not surprising. Nostradamus was a Frenchman. The majority of his prophecies concerned French history. The revolution was the major event in French history. It is logical that he should devote more space to it than to lesser events. Reading straight through the prophecies, it is hard not to feel a kind of awe. There are simply too many things that coincide. If one comes upon a stanza that mentions the republics, the republic reds and whites, and speaks of a torrent full of litter, it is reasonable to, to suppose that he is referring to the republic established by the revolution, to the republicans and royalists who were called reds and whites, and to the torrent of the revolution. And then he quotes another quatrain. When the litter of the whirlpool is poured out and their faces shall be covered by their cloaks, the cloak of legality under which the horrors were perpetrated, the Republic will be vexed by new men and their reds and whites shall hold opposite opinions about one another. End quote. Ooh, excuse me. Hmm. Page 258. We got eight pages to go. It may be well to remind readers briefly of the course of the French Revolution. In many respects, it re resembles the Russian Revolution of 1917. The king was a fool, his queen, Marie Antoinette, a spendthrift and a snob. At a time when the king should have been making concessions to the common people, she wanted to prevent anyone but an aristocrat from uh, being an officer in the army or a member of the government. But her extravagance brought the country to a point where it was necessary to levy new taxes on the landowners, and the landowners protested so loudly that the king had to agree to set up a kind of parliament made up of nobles, clergy, and, quote-unquote, the third estate, the commoners. When this parliament showed signs of wanting to curtail the king's freedom, he tried to disband it. Then it then to get his soldiers to scatter the rebellious commons by force. The soldiers refused, and the king had to climb down and grant the concessions. He moved foreign troops to Paris and prepared to break his promises. At this, the people revolted, and the result was national bloodshed, peasants burning the houses of the landowners and murdering their families. But the king remained safe. The National Assembly began the work of reforming the law, and everything might have blown over quietly if the king had not made his foolish attempt to escape. For everyone knew that he intended to rejoin his loyal troops in the east and crush the revolution. His capture was the turning point, and the turning point in French history. At this juncture, the new men, quote-unquote, arose to vex the Republic. Their names were Robespierre, Danton, and Marat, the ja Jacobins, Red Marat, the Jacobins, redder than the Reds. And when France became embroiled in a war with Austria and Prussia, and the Prussian Duke of Brunswick announced he meant to restore full powers to the French king, it was the end of Louis. The mob took over. All gentlefolk were arrested. 
Then mobs invaded the prisons and thrust them out, one by one, to be massacred by the crowds outside. The Duke of Brunswick changed his mind after a minor battle at Valmy and retreated. The Republic was proclaimed, the king and queen tried and executed. France declared war on England and set out to make Europe Republican. In Paris, the guillotine rose and fell with a monotonous thud. Robespierre took over after the murder of Marat by Charlotte Corday, the chemist Lavoisier, and the poet André Chenier, Chenier were guillotined for being aristocrats. Moderate Reds, Girondins, were guillotined for being moderate. Danton himself was guillotined for objecting to the bloodshed. Robespierre became a stall became a Stalin who inaugurated purge after purge. So became a Stalin or Stalin-like, I guess he's trying to say. Finally, when, we, when he hinted at another massive purge, the assembly turned on him and arrested him and his followers. His supporters in the Hotel de Ville rescued him. His enemies surrounded the hotel some of the Robespierre companions tried to leap out of the windows and injured themselves horribly on the railings. Robespierre himself had his lower jaw shot off and went to the guillotine after 17 hours of agony, his face wrapped roughly in a dirty bandage. The revolution was completed. The stage was set for the rise of Napoleon. In the light of this history, Nostradamus's number of hits can be seen more clearly. One of the earliest acts of the revolution was to replace the pro provinces of France, Normandy, Burgundy, and so on, with departments. So, another stan uh, quatrain, here we have, quote, Topography will be falsified, urns and monuments shall be opened, sects swarm, religious philosophy, for white, black, new, unripe, things green replace the antique end quote kind of an odd one the burial place of french kings at saint denis was violated and their ashes scattered observe that nostradamus writes nomumens nomumens instead of monuments another example of his curious anagrams sects per sects certainly pollulated I don't know what that means Laver thinks that sancte philosophy means that the rationalistic philosophy of Voltaire will replace religion but on the contrary the rationalist Hebert and his party were guillotined and Robespierre preached like a religious fanatic, uh, religious maniac so Sancte philosophy probably means precisely that. The French clergy were legislated out of existence and their money and goods used to finance a new currency. Um, okay, he doesn't give a translation of the next um, quatrain. Something about great torment. Total, total ruin. Um, something about um, silver. I, I, I. I new silver I, I i only get i only understand a few words of the french and if he's mixing italian in there then i'm really not understanding much of it okay so anyway 
That is an exceptionally queer, clear quatrain. Oh, he does quote it. He just didn't do it in the same way he's been doing it. The great people tormented, holy law in total ruin, all Christianity under other laws, when a new gold and silver mine is found. Ah, so I got parts of it. The people being tormented, Christianity, total ruin. Yeah, I got, I got the gist of it. So maybe my memory of French, at least in for reading, is better than I thought. Um, the goods of the clergy. Okay, so then another quatrain. The ramparts, the ramparts uh, shall be decried. People shall rise against their anointed king. Peace, a new saint, sacred laws made worse. Paris, Rappus, another anagram, was never in a worse state. So he's adding notes in the middle of the quatrain, so it's hard to read. Um, Anyway, the peace that comes after the people have, have risen against their king was the breathing space. When it looked as if all might return to normal again, the new saint is probably Robespierre with his ranting against atheists and his festival of the supreme being celebrated by his order in June 1894. Um, and then he has another one that he doesn't directly translate um but that he kind of explains it so the the grand cape trouble i don't know means the troubled king nostradamus always refers to the king as caput or cap with a full stop after it the reds march to sustain him the girondins the moderate reds by death, his family will be almost wiped out. The red reds will destroy the reds. I personally find this last line one of the most convincing in Nostradamus. Le rouge, rouge, le rouge, <laughs> assommerant, something like that. I know I butchered it. I know I butchered it. No better brief summary of the course of the revolution could be made. The red reds, the red, yeah, the reds destroy, I guess is what that means. It would be super, super erogatory, super erogatory. I've never seen that word before in my life. Super erogatory to go on quoting the dozen remaining stanzas that seem to refer clearly to the re revolution. They can be found in Laver's book or in Charles Ward's Oracles of Nostradamus. But there is one that I cannot resist quoting. Of the principal citizens of the rebellious city who tried to recover liberty masses beheaded unhappy melee cries howls at nantes pitiful to see many cities of france were shocked by the brutality of the jacobins in paris and rebelled in the name of a moderate republicanism lyons executed its Jacobin leader to defy Paris. Nantes also attempted to throw off the yoke of Paris. So did Marseille and Bordeaux. In due course, all paid very heavily for their boldness. But Nantes was unfortunate in falling under the domination of a madman named Carrier. He seems to have been literally insane. He talked droolingly of blood. He had fits during which he rolled on the floor and yapped and howled like a dog. His task to punish Nantes was a sadist delight, and he extracted every drop of pleasure from it. He hated children. They are all whelps, quote unquote, and had 500 of them taken to the meadows outside the town and slaughtered, shot down, then clubbed. 
He found the guillotine too slow to kill off the rebels, and he may have felt worried that the execution of children might cause a revolt against him. Some of the victims were so small that their necks would not reach across the block, and the blade sliced their heads in two. Then the executioner himself died of horror after executing four young sisters. Carrier devised a new method, noyades, noyades, uh, drowning. A barge filled with prisoners was hauled into the middle of the river, then a hole staved in its bottom. Men with hatchets waited until the last moment to make sure no one managed to free his hands and scramble out of the hold. A barge or raft would hold more than a hundred at a time. The sexual basis of these outrages is proved by another of Carrier's innovations, Republican marriages, in which a naked man and woman were tied together face to face and then drowned together. Swinburne wrote a sensual poem about it, but it is doubtful if the couple experienced much sexual stimulation. One man did escape a poultry dealer named Gustave Leroy by managing to cling to the bottom of a barge that stuck on a sandbank. When Robespierre fell, Carrier was put on trial, and Leroy told of how he had been one of 105 people to be towed out in a barge. One of them had asked a guard for a drink of water and wondered why the guards roared with laughter. Carrier and his fellow butchers were guillotined. In the face of all this, it is difficult to see how the stanza about the principal citizens of rebellious Nantes who tried to recover freedom and who were beheaded can refer to any episode but this. Even the unhappy melees or mixtures sounds like the Republican marriages. It would un admittedly be even more convincing if he had referred to this drownings, but in another stanza he speaks of the horrors of the revolution as being fire, water, iron, and rope, and says, quote, those who engineered these things shall die by them, end quote. He ends with the astonishing line, quote, except one who will spread ruin throughout the world, end quote, Napoleon. Considering that all the things he foretold were in the future, it seems strange that Nostradamus's obscure stanzas aroused any interest during his lifetime. In fact, they made him immediately famous. They are, in any case, so full of prophecies of fire, plague, blood, and torment that they no doubt satisfied the universal desire to hear about catastrophe. The Queen of France in 1555 was Catherine de Medici, who was an enthusiastic student of the occult. She had good reason to be. A remarkable prophet named Luke Garrick, or Garricus, had foretold the death of her husband, Henry II, in a duel, and Garrick's fame as a prophet was as great as that of the younger Nostradamus. Garrick worked by the stars, but there seems to be no doubt that he possessed occult gifts of the same type as Peter Herkos's in our own time. He cast the horoscope of Giovanni de Medici, a son of the great, great Lorenzo, and foretold correctly that he would become Pope. Giovanni became Leo X, the Pope with whom Luther clashed. In Scotland, Garrick told the Archbishop of St. Andrews that he would die on the scaffold, as he did, victim of Protestant enemies. On another occasion, his frankness brought unpleasant consequences. He told Giovanni Bentivoglio, tyrant of Bologna, that he would die in exile. The tyrant ordered five drops on the strapado, a form of torture in which the victim's hands were tied behind him, and then the victim was hoisted in the, into the air on a pulley and allowed to drop. Before he reached the floor, the rope was jerked upward again, which usually had the effect of dislocating the shoulders. It took Garrick some years to recover, but he had the satisfaction of seeing Pope Julius II drive the tyrant out of Bologna in accord with his prophecy. He even prophesied, prophesied that the exact date of the death of Pope Paul III, November 20th, 1549. 
Garrick had made the double prophecy concerning Henry II of France. First of all, he predicted that he would witness a duel when he came to the throne. The duel took place between Guy Sabot Jarnac and Francois Le Chataignier in 1547 and the king was present to see Chataignier Chataignier I don't know, killed the second part of the prophecy was that the king himself would die as a result of a duel this seemed unlikely enough but Catherine de Medici decided to double check with the new prophet of Ceylon. Nostradamus went to Paris and impressed Catherine, although there is no record of what passed between them. Nostradamus had already foretold the manner of the king's death in the centuries. Quote, the young lion shall overcome the old. In the field of war, in single fight, in a cage of gold, he will pierce his eyes, two wounds one, then die a cruel death. End quote. In 1559, the two daughters of Henry II married, one to Philip of Spain, one to the Duke of Savoy. Henry took part in a tournament held in celebration, forgetting, apparently, the prophecy about a duel. When he was jousting with the young Gabriel, Comte de Montgomery, Henry's eyeball was accidentally pierced by the shattered stump of his opponent's lance, which penetrated the gilt visor of his helmet, the cage of gold. It took him ten days to die, certainly a cruel death. Corys had to escape to England to escape the Queen's wrath. The phrase du classe une is obscure. Lever believes it to refer to a splinter of the lance that penetrated the king's throat, while while Ward translates it the last of two loppings, or sorry, the first of two loppings, assuming class to be the the uh, Greek classis lopping, una as the Latin una. First, the second lopping, referring to the murder of his son, Henry III, by the monk Jacques, Jacques Clement, Clement. Another stanza seems to refer to Catherine herself. Whew. These French names, man. Um, okay, so, quote, The lady shall remain to rule alone, her unique spouse dead on the field of honor. After mourning seven long years, she will live and reign long. Catherine, end quote, sorry. Catherine mourned her husband for seven years and lived and reigned for another 30 years, or at least played an extremely active part in the affairs of France. Henry II was succeeded by Francis II, a sickly youth, whose horoscope Nostradamus had cast at the request of the king. Nostradamus has a stanza that declares that the eldest son of the widow shall die before he reaches the age of 18. His next eldest brother will be affianced, even younger. Francis died of blood poisoning six weeks before his 18th birthday. His neurotic brother, Charles IX, only 10 at the time, was affianced to Elizabeth of Aus... Oh. Affian... Affiance. Affianced to Elizabeth in of Australia, uh, Austria <laughs> at 11. In his 14th year, the king paid a visit to Nostradamus at Ceylon, accompanied, of course, by his mother. Catherine asked Nostradamus to draw up a horoscope of her younger son, the Duke of Anjou, and Nostradamus told her he would succeed to the throne, but he was even more interested in young Henry of Navarre, who was also in the royal train. He asked to see him naked, but the boy was afraid he was going to be beaten and refused. Nostradamus went into his bedchamber early the next morning and examined him. He stated that Henry would one day become king. This makes it seem clear that Nostradamus's predictions of some or some of them were not based on astrology, but upon some kind of intuition or second sight. He may have wanted to examine marks on the boy, boy's body. The record does not specify. 
In fact, Charles the Ninth, the king responsible for the massacre of St. Bartholomew, died of tuberculosis in his mid-twenties. Henry the Third, who succeeded him, was stabbed by the monk Jacques Clement as he sat in the lavatory. Henry of Navarre, a Protestant, proceeded to the throne. All this is foretold with some precision in Nostradamus. The ma massacre of the Huguenots, Protestants, on the eve of St. Bartholomew is also foretold by Nostradamus. Okay, so then here's another one he doesn't directly translate. Uh, Noir is Nostradamus' usual anagram of Roi. ROI king Charles was certainly a ferocious king he insisted on disemboweling the game himself when out hunting and had a curious habit of blowing out the brains of any pigs or donkeys he bet with during the massacre he was leaning out of the window of the Louvre with an arquebus shouting kill kill the ferocious king when he was has quote okay this is a quote the ferocious king when he has tried out his hand with fire iron arquebus all the people will be afraid to see the greatest man hung by the neck and feet end quote admiral coligny leader of the huguenots was the chief target of the massacre catherine had persuaded her son that he must be killed and charles finally shouted hysterically quote, all right but kill every other huguenot in france at the same time end quote galigny was dragged through paris and hanged upside down from a gibbet it is interesting to speculate whether this might have been anything to do with the hanging man card in the tarot but the dates make it unlikely Nostradamus's health began to break down. In his 60s, his gout changed to dropsy. He foretold his own death with his usual precision. Quote, On his return from his embassy, the king's gift put in its place, he will do no more, being gone, gone to God. By close relations, friends, blood brothers, he will be found near the bed and bench. End quote. Nostradamus had been sent to Arles as the representative of Ceylon. On his return, he was found dead near the bed, lying on the bench he used to hoist himself into bed. He was buried upright in the wall of the church of the Cordelier at his own request. The centuries, the, the book, The Centuries, have continued to be studied ever since. One of its most disquieting prophecies declares, quote, like the great king of the Ang Anglomois, the year <clears throat> 1999, seventh month, the great king of terror will descend from the sky. At this time, Mars will reign for the good cause. End quote. Sorry. Some take this to mean the end of the world, while others think it may mean an invasion from outer space. I can see how he didn't know, because this is in 71. 1999, the seventh month. Okay, never mind. Um, my thinking was off there. I was thinking seventh month, September, is actually seven. So, any, anyway, um, I know it's the ninth month, but it should actually be seven, the seventh month. Some take this to mean the end of the world, while others think it may mean an invasion from outer space. The Grand Roy de Effroyeur sounds unpleasantly like a hydrogen bomb. The great king of the Anglomois is almost certainly Genghis Khan. Anglomois is another of Nostradamus's anagrams for Mongol Mongolians. Perhaps he is warning against the yellow peril, quote unquote. 
Laver is of the opinion that Nostradamus may be following a notion similar to the Middle Ages that the world would last 7,000 years. It was assumed to have been created 4,000 B.C. Archbishop Usher gives the date as 4004 B.C., based on a careful calculation of all the ages given in the Bible. The millennium is the last thousand years of the Earth's existence, so Nostradamus may have calculated July 1999 as the beginning of the end rather than the end. It may be worth the while of world statesmen to make special efforts for peace in mid-1999. And that is the end of that chapter. Woohoo! It's an interesting chapter. I, I find Nostradamus to be fascinating. But that leads us to part two, chapter five, Adepts and Imposters. And hopefully it's not another 60-page chapter. Uh, we'll see. Let me go ahead and look ahead here. Oh, I really need to get some actual glasses and not these cheaters. They don't agree with me. They work very well, but I take them off and then all of a sudden I'm like even worse for a little while. Okay, from the looks of it, it is going to be a m very long chapter. Oh, somebody's been writing notes in here. I did buy this book used. Okay, so this next chapter is 58 pages, so we're going to have to break it up too. There's no way I'm getting through it. Um, can I do... Twenty nine pages in a sitting and do it in two. Maybe I'll think about that. Twenty two is not too bad, but twenty nine might be a bit of a stretch. Anyway, that'll be that for tonight. Um, I am not gaming, so let's um, see who is around. Critical Role has 15,000 people watching. They don't need us. Um, Dice Legends has 18. Um, Captain Robert, I don't know if they're on like a summer hiatus or what, but they just keep doing marathon after marathon after marathon of pre-recorded stuff. So I'm not going to give, I'm not going to do anything with them. Uh, Mr. Blitzer is playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, haven't been over to him in a while. Let's go to Mr. Blitzer. So bear with me just a minute and we'll head on over there. My heart hides please be I know I know the reasons is fine fine is please broken one and one please be because I have seen the Yeah. 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 Yeah.